My name is Tracy Davis, and I am super happy to be here with you this morning. I serve as Senior Equity Advisor to Define Learning, but before that, um, I had the luxury of serving as probably every role in a school district, from a teacher to an assistant principal, principal, area soup, deputy soup, and served as a superintendent in Washoe County for seven and a half years. And currently, I work with organizations, including AASA, and I help train future superintendents. Um, and I do a little work with the Department of Defense around STEM learning. But the most important thing I love that I do is help people continue to do good work for the 56 million students who enter into our public schools. I have two children of my own and understand how important it is. And one of the things I loved about when I joined Define was this belief uh, around providing students experiences early on to decide what they wanted to do in life. And I have two kids and I'll tell you that they took pathways that I'd never imagined, especially uh, a student with a disability who I thought should have a gap year. Um, and she decided to go to college and finish in four years, whereas my son that was in gate decided to drop out, but they found their pathways. And what I think is important around these pathways and college and career readiness is how do we give kids an opportunity to dabble early on? So a couple of side notes before we start this um, webinar, it's a good time for you to look at um, and review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. So check your audio setting on your computer as well as your volume. You know how important that is. Um, in the Q&A, which some of you are already familiar with because the chat was disabled, drop your questions as we go. I have a lot of people helping me out. We'll pull those questions and answer as many as we can, um, especially ones that are pertinent so you can get those answers. So type them in the Q&A box. Um, and then finally, as you think about um, the on, dem on uh, a demand archive of today's presentation will be located for you in the resources page and Today's keynote speaker, today's keynote speaker is Dr. Jay Mitchell. And I'll tell you what, someone already said, I know Jay, he's famous. And when we were chatting and talking, I had the pleasure of talking to him before. He said, Tracy, don't read that long old resume. Like, that's crazy. People are here to learn. And I was like, oh, what? You're talking about that three page resume? But you always have to give honor where honor is doing good work. So, Jay brings a wealth of experience developed during a rich and varied career in education. He has served as director of the Maryland Assessments Consortium, a state collaboration of school districts working together to develop and share formative performance assessments. And we know how crucial performance assessments are. Nikti is an accomplished author, having co-authored 14 books. Jay, what I didn't tell you was she also wrote that they use a lot of your writings in her master's class, so she became very prolific in the Jay McTie um, writings. But the inc one of his books include the award-winning, and we all know, uh, best-selling Understanding by Design series with Grant Wiggins. His books have been translated into 10 languages. He has also written more um, than 35 articles and chapters and books, so he is well accomplished. I am going to let him have the opportunity to share his screen. But lastly, he's been published in many journals, including educational leadership, and we are excited to have him here this morning to drop some words of wisdom and knowledge on us. Jay? Tracy, thank you. <laughs> Tracy, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you so much, and hello to everyone. Um, I'm not from the universe, despite my background. I'm coming to you from Columbia, Maryland, on the East Coast, where the sun has arisen. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into this. Um, you see my title, Easing into Project-Based Learning, and I want to um, jump right into it. Now, Tracy uh, mentioned her children, and so I'm going to be personal to start. Here are my grandchildren. And being a grandparent is a fascinating uh, part of life, a time of life. And I have to tell you, I, I really think about these young people and what their future is going to be, including what school experiences I hope for them. One of my favorite quotations is on the screen. And we know this is the case. 
the world is very different than when many of us, most of us were coming up. And some of the factors that we know are in play in today's world, the fact that knowledge continues to grow and expand. In fact, there's been some um, experts who describe knowledge growing every third or doubling every 13 months. I'm not sure how you quantify that, but we know that knowledge is not static, it's growing. Although our time with students in school has been essentially fixed for some time, that has implications for what we focus on. We also know that people have access to information in ways that have never been imaginable in the past. You can access virtually or almost any information on a handheld device. This has implications for our world. This is just one of many stats about the increasing availability of instant information access. We know that the world is unpredictable and that unpredictable, unpredictability has implications for what and how we teach and the, cult, the the develop the capacities and competencies we're trying to develop in young persons. We know that there are a number of technological factors that are coming together. Uh, you're familiar with the quote, internet of things, where increasingly we have internet enabled devices that speak to each other uh, and communicate outside of the home. We know that automation, robotics, big data, artificial intelligence are all convening. And these are having major impacts on careers. You're no doubt familiar with the generative AI systems such as chat, uh, chat GPT uh, that are predictably going to be transformative. We're, we're in the early stages of seeing what these can do. So I know I'm speaking to the choir uh, about these points, but the reality of our world today implies for me that there are job uh, skill sets needed in the world of today, not only in the job market, but in life that transcend what we often think of as the traditional subject matter. You no doubt have seen lists of the sort that is on the screen. This is simply one coming from the World Economic Forum describing the skill sets that are going to be not only will be, but are especially valued in the work today, in the workplace today. Many schools and districts, and I suspect many people that are on this webinar are in a school or a district that has identified a profile or portrait of a graduate. And often in these profile, you'll see the five or six C's such as the ones on the screen. And this is a recognition that there are goals in education that transcend traditional subject matter. Tracy referenced my work with Understanding by Design, and I'd like to briefly highlight something that's been a longstanding part of UBD, but it relates to our, our world today. Uh, Grant Wiggins and I have written about, categorically speaking, three interrelated but not identical goals for modern learning. We have acquisition goals, namely what knowledge as in factual knowledge and basic concepts, and along with skills, including basic skills, should students acquire. Well, of course, students need knowledge and skills. You can't do anything meaningful without these. I think of them as foundational. And as you well know, if you're in the States or Canada or Australia, uh, state and national uh, standards have specified often in great detail what students should know and be able to do. But we also have what I like to call understanding goals. And an understanding goal is more than a fact and it's not a skill, it's a conceptual understanding. It's around big ideas and core processes. And that when you understand something, you're enabled to use it. And that highlights a third goal of transfer. Transfer, as you know, is the ability of a learner to take what's been learned and effectively and appropriately apply that to something new, something they haven't seen before. And if we know anything about the modern world, 
we're preparing students for a world that is not predictable and that they will be encountering new things, new opportunities and challenges throughout their lives. And therefore the, the ability of students to transfer their learning to me is, is a basic. So to summarize, these are three interrelated goals for learning. They're not new, we, we know these things, but the distinctions among them matter. They matter for how we teach. They also have impact or influence on what and how we assess. And we should know this. If I wanna see if a student knows something as in the ability to remember or recall, an objective test or quiz will let me know if the student knows it or, or does not. But if I wanna see if a student really understands and can apply their learning effectively, I need more performance-based measures that call for application uh, and transfer. Um, thumbs up if you know the name Dr. John Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E. Well, I, I'm sure some of you have your thumbs up because he is a, a now famous researcher from New Zealand. And um, I've gotten to know John Hattie in recent years and he sent me an article and I'm gonna summarize the article using my graphic. John Hattie says, in all my years studying and teaching and learning, I concluded that we can think about three levels of learning. John says there's surface level learning, typified by when teachers present new information to students. And the students may take it in, they may take notes, but if they don't do anything with that information, it will stay on the surface and eventually, if not quickly, fade from memory. Then John says there's deep learning, which he defines as I do as learning with and for understanding. But deep learning is below the surface and it takes time for students to really come to understand something deeply. And then John agrees with Grant Wiggins and I that the ultimate goal and the deepest learning is evident when students can transfer. So this is again, one of the prominent researchers in our profession highlighting ideas that I think are really important in, in our world of education today. In a book that I co-wrote with my colleague and friend Harvey Silver called Teaching for Deeper Learning, we adopted the definition of deeper learning from the National Research Council, and it's on the screen. The National Research Council highlights transfer as really an important goal. But we also see reference to deep learning from people like Michael Fullen or the Deeper Learning Network through High Tech High School and, and affiliates, where deep learning is defined not only as understanding subject matter, but deep learning of these, these cross-disciplinary competencies, the things you see in a portrait or profile of a graduate. And the methodology for developing these competencies is project-based learning. So I wanna get now into the title of my session, easing into project-based learning. My experience, and I've been in this profession now 52 years, is that certainly project-based learning is a viable, authentic, engaging means of developing these important uh, real world competencies and preparing students to apply their learning uh, to various situations. But I also would propose that a related pathway um, is through the use of performance tasks. Now, these I think will be familiar to, to most, if not all, listeners. To me, a performance task is simply any learning activity and or assessment task that ask students to perform with their learning, to take what they've learned and do something with it. So it's application oriented and a performance task typically yields a tangible product and or some actual performance that can be viewed. Here's a definition of project-based learning. The PBL works folks, which to me is the preeminent uh, uh, authority on PBL, uh, defines project-based learning as a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real world and personally meaningful projects. So I like to think of performance tasks and projects as in PBL as related, 
but they're not twins. I think they're more like cousins. So let me summarize some distinctions between performance tests and projects, which I contend, by the way, are similar pathways toward important uh, learning ends. Typically, performance tasks are shorter in duration. Um, they may often or often subject specific, although we can have interdisciplinary performance tasks. Generally, performance tasks, in my experience, are teacher directed, although students might have some choice. Um, tasks may be authentic or simulate authenticity. Um, the audience for performance tasks are typically the teacher, but there might be other audiences involved, either real or simulated. Um, and the teacher is generally the one who evaluates what students do on a, on a performance task. Where projects tend to be longer term in time frame, often are multidisciplinary because they're framed around real world issues and problems, more genuinely authentic. Um, often projects are presented to real audiences other than just the teacher. Um, and in some cases, projects are evaluated not just by the teacher, but by others, including in some cases, actual experts. So again, there are a lot of similarities, but they're not identical. So here is, from my experience, um, a set of questions that I think are important for schools or districts that wish to move more fully into project-based learning. I think it's absolutely a powerful method. It's engaging for learners. It builds the right skill sets. But I offer, I guess, a cautionary note if you're at the early stages of this journey. Here are some questions that I think it's important to consider. At the present time, do you think your teachers, or as a teacher yourself, are you comfortable facilitating open-ended, long-term projects that are often more student-directed? Because there's skill sets involved by teachers in facilitating PBL. Similarly, do your students presently have the skill set to manage long-term projects, particularly if they're not told what to do every step of the way. My experience is in many schools, uh, this would be a shock to students who often are told exactly what to do and compliance seems to be the key virtue. Do your current school structures support what's needed of the infrastructure, if you will, for project-based learning? To me, projects are inherently multidisciplinary. Accordingly, it's important to have time for teachers across subject areas to get together to plan such projects. If you don't have that time, it's gonna be hard to engineer long-term multidisciplinary projects, particularly at the secondary level. Do parents understand what PBL is about, its goals and its methods? Because some parents, believe that if the child's not working in a textbook or a, or a series of dittos, somehow they're not learning. Or if the teacher's standing back and letting the students direct, that some parents might say, well, wait a minute, we're paying you to teach. Two more questions. Project-based learning is powerful, rich, but it takes time. And if you bring in a PBL methodology, something's got to give. What are you willing to let go of? In my experience, one of the casualties of PBL is you're not gonna be able to cover as much content. And with all due respect to people that say this, I don't think it's honest to say, oh, we can teach all the standards in all the subject areas using project-based learning. I, I don't think that's, that's true. I think you have to prioritize and focus. The amount of content you can cover will be reduced but arguably uh, for a good reason. And finally, among many questions we could ask, if you really have a profile of a graduate and are engaging in more of a project-based learning methodology, uh, what does that mean for your report cards? What are you reporting on? What does it mean for grading? These are some of the systemic factors that need to be considered. So with these in mind, here's my recommendation. If you are on the beginning uh, pathway to project-based learning, 
I encourage you as a teacher, as an administrator, as a district person to think big. Think about what this could and should look like in two, three, four, five years. But start small. This is a major initiative if you're new to it. Uh, so be cautious about going too fast. Work smart. Use well-developed resources, such as those that Defined Learning provides and other uh, resources that are available. And go for early wins. Maybe at the start, start as a voluntary project or bring together a group of teachers that want to do this as opposed to mandating it on people who may not be ready or don't understand it. So with those cautionary notes put forth, I wanna give you my best thinking about how you can ease into project-based learning if, if that's appropriate for your setting. And it relates to something that I call task and I could add project variables. My longtime friend, John Larmer and I have written um, a blog post about this that uh, Define Learning has um, and it's available. I think it's been posted for you uh, for this session. Let me briefly highlight examples of task variables. And the, um, the little slider at the top of my screen is suggestive. If you're familiar with a whiteboard, a soundboard or a whiteboard or a rheostat where you can dial up or down the volume, dial up or down the volume or the intensity of light. Think about a set of dimensions and you can choose where along each dimension you and students and teachers are ready. So you might think one end of the, of the continuum would be more performance tasks and the other end would be full blown project-based learning. So let's look at a few of these. I'm gonna look at six, starting with time frame, direction and degree of integration. So let's look at a few examples. Time frame. When you're starting out, I think there's virtue in starting small, and that includes short tasks that are manageable in a short time frame. And there are performance tasks that can be completed by students in one or two class periods. Many performance tasks might go over three or four. But when we start getting into project-based learning, we're, we're typically looking at longer term projects, two weeks, three weeks, et cetera. Here are a few quick examples. Here is a short performance task that can be, a, pardon me, accomplished by students in one class period. And this was developed by a ninth grade math teacher for a unit on introductory statistics, particularly focusing on mean, median, mode, measure of central tendency. I love this. To me, this is authentic. It's authentic to the students, and yet it engages them in applying their learning. And as an assessment, it's revealing, but it's short. Here's a mid-session performance task where the students have to plan a four-day tour for their state or province or region, as if they're um, presenting it to visitors from outside to help the visitors understand the history, geography, and economy of their state, province, or region. So this would take a bit more time for students to complete. Now let's look all the way on the other side of the continuum. My daughter Maria taught at High Tech High School in San Diego. Some of you know or recognize High Tech High as one of the preeminent project-based learning schools in the country. And kids at High Tech High do long-term, semester-long in some cases, projects, multidisciplinary, student-directed. And this is one that my daughter helped facilitate with another teacher. The students had to research, design, and construct a tiny house, energy self-sufficient, to be erected in a park in San Diego Memorial Day weekend. That's long-term. And not all schools can jump into that right away, in my experience. All right, direction. Who will direct the task or project? I won't show you specific examples because you can envision this, but 
if you start small and you're introducing students to more application oriented activities, uh, you might give them a, a fairly directed uh, task. But over time, you're going to hopefully get students to become a little more self-directed, moving toward getting them to become especially uh, and, and more um, directly self-directed. In other words, you're moving on a continuum from directing them to releasing responsibility gradually so that they become more able to direct on their own. A third dimension, integration. To what extent is the task or project subject specific or interdisciplinary? Here's an example of a subject specific performance task in science. Where the students have to develop a, uh, an investigation for um, confirming or dis, uh, discrediting a claim. And essentially it's a, it's a scientific methodology kind of task as you can see, but it's subject specific to science. Here's a task that brings in communication, which could be in the province of English language arts, even though the task involves science, math, statistics. And by the way, in my experience, almost any performance task in one subject area other than ELA can and should have a communication part. So you can naturally bring in listening, speaking, reading, writing, and research along with um, other content areas. But when you look at more complex projects in project-based learning, they are often multidisciplinary. All right, three more variables, student choice, options. Here's your task, no choice for students. Even though the task involves application, higher order thinking, it's specified. We can have tasks that have some choice for students or often in project-based learning, we really open it up and the students have lots of choices they have to navigate. Audience and evaluation are other variables. Let's look briefly at each. Here's an example of a performance task. It's authentic, but there's not a lot of choice here. You have basically dictated what the student is asked to do. Although you could argue that their infographics will look different, that's fine but the task itself is directed. Here's a performance task in visual art where the students have studied a particular artist, in this case, Faith Ringgold, and their task is to emulate Faith Ringgold's narrative art to express something about themselves. And so there's a lot of choice about the substance of what they communicate, and they even have choice of the the visual media. So even though it's in the world of art, it, it might be subject specific, there's a fair amount of choice for students. And here's a wonderful project developed by a friend of mine named Mark Wise. Uh, by the way, this is a wonderful project that I would recommend to any of you interested in PBL. Just Google Mark Wise Global Challenge. Uh, this is a week-long immersive project uh, where there's a great deal of choice, including which global challenge kids work on, how they go about their work, how they formulate their, answer, their ideas and their presentation. And it's largely student-directed. Audience. Often for performance tasks, the audience for students' work is the teacher. But as we go into project-based learning, often we can bring in other audiences. Uh, here's an uh, example of a performance task developed by the Literacy Design Collaborative, uh, a wonderful group. And what you see in red are options. Essentially, the task is a task involving research, developing and supporting an argument uh, for an audience. But there's, there's some choice here about the topic, the issue, um, the product, and even the audience. 
Here's an example from Ramsey School District where all fifth graders in the district uh, develop, prepare, and deliver a TED Talk. And they present to an audience of parents and uh, relatives and fellow students. So it's a real audience in this case. And here's an example of project-based learning uh, where in the fall before the pandemic closed many schools, this government class produced a voter's guide in print and multimedia, social media form. It's authentic and the audience were their community, a real audience. Finally, and briefly, evaluation. Who will judge what students do in a task or project? Well, often it's the teacher, but as we get into more project-based learning, we often bring in other audiences. So in Mark Wise's Global Challenge, there are literally uh, volunteer adult judges, many of whom have some expertise in the problem area or the goal area that the students are working on. And Mark Wise will tell you, the kids take it seriously, knowing they're gonna be presenting in front of a group of adults who know something about their topic. There's a lot more we could say about this, but, um, oh, by the way, I'm putting up uh, my daughter's former, former high school where, where she worked, high tech high, where projects are invariably presented to uh, outsiders and adults and experts. All right, so my time is just about up. So I'm gonna reiterate my recommendation. If you're moving into project-based learning, think big, envision what this could look like in your school or district two, three, four years from now. Start small, work smart. For instance, use the great resources from Defined Learning because they have shorter performance tasks and longer term projects. They have a suite of resources. And again, go for early wins. If you're new to this, look for uh, the teachers and the, and the students that are gonna give you an early win because it's easier to build off an early win than to try to cover, recover from a misstep. So, I'm gonna leave you with a few resources. Of course, Defined Learning is a preeminent resource. An article which John Larmer and I wrote has, uh, describes these uh, dimensions or continua that I presented to you. So you have that. Here's a provocative article. Um, what if we map the curriculum, not just as scope and sequence of content to be covered, but what if we map the curriculum around the performances we wanted students doing? Hence, imagine curriculum maps of performance tasks and projects, K to 12, across the grades. And then our job as teachers was not just cover stuff, but to prepare students to apply their learning. This article pre presents that vision. And then if you're interested, Mark Wise and I wrote an article around his extraordinary project. Um, and so you can check that out. And finally, a uh, shameless plug for a recent book, Designing Authentic Tasks and Projects, has a lot of practical information about these points. All right, my time is up. Um, I'm gonna turn this back to Tracy and see um, if there are questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Um, and I know the, the schedule's tight, so um, thank you for listening and I will await uh, the next steps here. Okay. Jay, thank you so much. We have a couple of uh, questions. Um, one quick question was, um, can you say the name of the Global Challenge Project again, the actual name of it? One of our folks asked what was the name of it. Yeah, the, the project literally is titled The Global Challenge. It was developed in West Windsor, Plainsboro, New Jersey School District. And Mark Wise is the curriculum director who, who it was his brainchild and if you, if you Google global challenge, maybe space wise, you will find it. And, and take some time to look at the website that he's prepared. It's extraordinary and uh, it's an amazing project. Thank you. Here's another great question. Um, it's it's kind of lofty. So with changes happening so fast and with automation, AI, et cetera, 
becoming part of life, becoming a part of life for everyone. And what 21st century and onward, can teachers still predict what lifelong learning skills can be given to the students so that they can continue to learn on their own after schooling and be able to stay relevant and responsive and in this ever-changing global society? That's the great question. Um, okay. I'll give you a very short answer. And there's a lot we could say about that. To me, just the concept of self-directed learning and developing the competencies and the dispositions or habits of self-directed learning to me should be considered a, a basic skill for the future. Um, and, and if we commit to self-directed learning and we use understanding by design kind of framework, it means we're gonna identify a self-directed learning as a system or district-wide or school-wide goal. We're gonna identify what students need to understand about being self-directed. And we would actually build a set of understandings and associated essential questions that we would use with students to build their capacity. And then we would need to have opportunities through performance tasks, projects, et cetera, where they have to increasingly be self-directed. In other words, we can't spoon feed them and then expect them to magically be able to be autonomous. Thank you. I, listen, it is a treat to always have you in the building to talk with us. So I gotta ask one more question. Um, have studies or info been collected from CTE schools and their work that they're doing with project-based learning? And then are there examples of collaborations with CTE schools and traditional high schools to do PBL? That's a great question. And I am I I don't have a research base to cite. And perhaps others on the uh, webinar today will be better suited to answer that. Um, I will, however, observe that folks in CTE or career tech oriented uh, disciplines to me have been the project based leaders and the authentic application leaders in our schools for many, many years. Um, and I like to say they're the experts. If you want to know what good authentic learning and project-based learning looks like, look at the CTE folks and we can learn a lot from them. But I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't cite research studies around those particular questions. Well, as we close this off, I personally want to say, I love the slide around loving the ideas for action because they were like really succinct, right? And if you were in a district, it's a jumping board to like, just how do you get started? Because sometimes people think they got to go full-fledged ahead and failure happens. So I love that you listed those four quick ideas. And every time I'm with you and every time we talk, you always massage my thinking around relevant, deeper learning for our students. So we totally appreciate having you this morning with us. And as always, it's a pleasure for me to get to hang out with you a little bit. Thank you so much.